Hey, crew. It's Pitt, and I am back with some more esoterica. Today, we are diving back into the works of Mrs. Helena Blavatsky. This is Isis Unveiled. We are reading aloud and discussing as we go along the various points that are brought to light by the text. It's not the format for everyone, but some people seem to find enjoyment in it, so you are more than welcome to tag along as we continue our exploration. Before we begin, however, if you are unfamiliar with me, any of my unconventional beliefs, or if at any point in time I lose you in the terminology, there will be several playlists linked in the corner above and the box down below along with the original source material so that you can get a better understanding of who I am and why I say the things that I do. A particular note today is almost certainly going to be the unconventional Bible study and the unconventional New Testament where we talk in some great detail about the things that are going to be discussed here today. With that being said, we are going to dive in and continue our exploration of Isis Unveiled with chapter or part two, chapter three, part two. The narrative of the Apostle Paul in his second epistle to the Corinthians, 12, 3, and 4, has struck several scholars well-versed in the descriptions of the mystical rites of the initiation given by some classics as alluding most undoubtedly to the final epopatia. I knew a certain man, whether in body or outside of body, I know not. God knoweth, who was wrapped into paradise, and heard things ineffable, which is not lawful for a man to repeat. I have a little bit of that testimony myself. If you were unaware, I had a spiritual experience where I was pulled out of my body. Right, I was fully aware of my body where it was, but I wasn't in it. I was pulled out and given a grand tour of the entirety of the universe. I was told to go out and spread the message that I am doing now. I fought it for a very long time, but I I have done this, right? And so that is my authority, which is exactly the same as the Apostle Paul's authority, right? It is my assertion that this thing has happened. That is the exact same authority that Paul had. He's not talking about Paul here, right? Or about himself, but okay. These words have rarely, so far as we know, been regarded by commentators as an allusion to the beatific visions of an initiated seer. But the phraseology is unequivocal. These things, which it is not lawful to repeat, are hinted at in the same words, and the reason for it assigned is the same as that which we find repeatedly expressed by Plato, Proclus, Iamblichus, Herodotus, and other classics. We speak wisdom only among them who are perfect, says Paul, the plain and undeniable translation of the sentence being. <clears throat> we speak of the profounda, or final, esoteric doctrines of the mysteries, which were denominated wisdom, only among them who are initiated. So, in relation to the man who was wrapped into paradise, and who was evidently Paul himself, we don't know that, right? If he says it's someone else, we're going to take it for granted that it's someone else. It's probably him, but he didn't say that it was. So that's, that's why I said somebody else to begin with, right? Because even though it appears that he is speaking about himself, he is giving it as though it is someone else. So we're going to take it as someone else. The Christian word paradise having replaced that of Elysium. To complete the proof, we might recall the words of Plato, given elsewhere, which show that before an initiate could see the gods in their purest light, he had to be become liberated from his body. In example, to separate his astral soul from it. Apuleius also describes his initiation into the mysteries in the same way. I approached the confines of death, and having trodden on the threshold of Prosperpina, returned having been carried through all the elements. In the depths of midnight I saw the sun glittering with a splendid light, together with the infernal and supernal gods, and to these divinities approaching, I paid the tribute of devout adoration. Now, my spiritual experience is different from that. There were no entities really involved. I was taken out, carried, held, however you want to view it, but I didn't see a face. 
I didn't even really see the hands that were carrying me. It was just me being carried along. I, mean, I felt the enveloping, but I wasn't really visibly seeing the hands. I saw the universe being created. I saw the interconnectedness of all life. I saw a lot of things, but I did not see any gods. I didn't see any spirits. I didn't see any angels. I didn't see any demons. I didn't see any ghosts. I saw none of that. I saw the interconnectedness of humanity with all of life. I saw that. I saw the creation of the universe. I saw that. I saw some parts of how it's going to stop. I saw that. I was initiated into an order. All as a spiritual experience with no faces at all. I did not see any part of that. And so I hold that it's not a necessary part of it. It may be. Maybe I was completely delusional. At the time, I was not taking any drugs. Right? I smoked cannabis. That's part of my pain procedure but even then I wasn't doing that I was completely sober it was something completely outside of myself it was not something I was even seeking I wasn't even in meditation it was just something that happened to me so just to put it out there right here at the beginning that I differ greatly from some of the experiences of the other mystics and people who are teaching you I am telling you the things that have happened to me and the things which I know about Thus, in common with Pythagoras and other Hierophant reformers, Jesus divided his teachings into exoteric and esoteric. Following faithfully the Pythagorean Essenian ways, he never sat at a meal without saying grace. The priest prays before his meal, says Josephus, describing the Essenes. Jesus also divided his followers into neophytes, brethren, and the perfect if we may judge by the difference he made between them. But his career, at least as a public rabbi, was of too short a duration to allow him to establish a regular school of his own. And with the exception, perhaps of John, it does not seem that he had initiated any other apostle. That's interesting. The Gnostic amulets and talismans are mostly the emblems of the apocalyptic allegories, the seven vowels, are closely related to the seven seals, and the mystic title, Abraxas, partakes as much of the composition of Shem Hampirosh, Shem Hampirosh, the holy word, or ineffable name, as the name called. The word of God that no man knew but himself, as John expresses it. And again, I have been given a word, I think that it is probably the word that the Masons are seeking, and it's probably the word that is being talked about here, but I cannot be certain of that, right? I have a word. It is an effective word, but it is not something that I can give. It is one of the few things that I am restricted from discussing in any more detail than I am doing now. I have the word. I can use the word personally, but I cannot give it to anyone. It is not part of the authorization that I have. But the seven vowels and the seven seals, if y'all don't know, the number seven is quite important. There are seven internal uh, chakras. They are linked to the one external chakra, making a total of eight. But the seven seals and the seven vowels and the seven sounds and the seven thunders, and that is all probably related to the chakras. I have not done a full breakdown of that. When I did my Bible review, we weren't even really dealing with the chakras in the detail that we do now. A lot has changed in the last year, much less over the last couple of years. It would be difficult to escape from the well-adduced proofs that the apocalypse is the production of an initiated Kabbalist. When this revelation presents whole passages taken from the books of Enoch and Daniel, which latter is in itself an abridged uh, imitation of the former, I don't find that to be true at all. We have done both Daniel and the book of Enoch. And in honesty, the first book of Enoch is the only one that I have dealt with that seems like it may even be from the correct time period or even dealing with the correct mysteries. The later books from second Enoch on all seem to be much later insertions of Christian dogma into a time when that would not have been a thing at all. Um, there is great reasons to doubt even the first book of Enoch, 
but if any of them were to be true, it would be the first one. Daniel is not even closely related to the books of Enoch. I do not understand how there can be that uh, comparison being made here. Maybe I'm just missing something, but I have done the Bible study. We have talked about it in extensive detail. And while Daniel absolutely was a magician or a wizard or a sorcerer or however you want to look at it, that doesn't bear correlating resemblance even to Enoch. So. <clears throat> and when, furthermore, we ascertain that the Ophite Gnostics, who rejected the Old Testament entirely as emanating from an inferior being, Jehovah, ex <laughs> accepted the most ancient prophets, such as Enoch, and deduced the strongest support from this book for their religious tenets. The demonstration becomes evident. We will show further how closely related are all these doctrines. Besides, there is the history of Domitian's persecutions of the magicians and philosophers, which affords as good a proof as any that John was generally considered a Kabbalist. As the apostle was included among the number and, moreover, conspicuous, the imperial edict banished him not only from Rome, but even from the continent. It was not the Christians whom, confounding them with the Jews, as some historians will have it, the emperor persecuted but the astrologers and Kabbalists. The accusations against Jesus of practicing the magic of Egypt were numerous, and at one time universal, in the towns where he was known. The Pharisees, as claimed in the Bible, had been the first to fling it in his face, although Rabbi Wise considers Jesus himself a Pharisee. The Talmud certainly points to James the Just as one of that sect, but these partisans are known to have always stoned every prophet who denounced their evil ways, and it is not on this fact that we base our assertion. These accused him of sorcery, and out of driving out devils by Beelzebub, their prince, with as much justice as later the Catholic clergy had to accuse of the same more than one innocent martyr. But Justin Martyr states on better authority that the men of his time, who were not Jews, asserted that the miracles of Jesus were performed by magical art, the very expression used by the skeptics of those days to designate <clears throat> the feats of thaumaturgy accomplished in the pagan temples. They even ventured <clears throat> sorry, they even ventured to call him a magician and a deceiver of the people, complains the martyr. In the Gospel of Nicodemus, the act of Pilate the Jews bring the same accusation before Pilate. Did we not tell thee he was a magician? Celsus speaks of the same charge, and as the Neoplatonist believes in it, the Talmudic literature is full of the most minute particulars, and their greatest accusation is that Jesus could fly as easily in the air as others could walk. St. Austin asserted that it was generally believed that he had been initiated in Egypt and that he wrote books concerning magic, which he delivered to John. There was a work called Magia Jesu Christi, which was attributed to Jesus himself. I would love to get my hands on that. In the Clementine recognitions, the charges brought against Jesus that he did not perform his miracles as a Jewish prophet, but as a magician, an example, an initiate of the heathen temples. It was usual then, as it is now, among the intolerant clergy of opposing religions, as well as among the lower classes of society, and even among those patricians who, for various reasons, had been excluded from any participation of the mysteries, to accuse, sometimes, the highest hierophants and adepts of sorcery and black magic. So, Apuleius, who had been initiated, was likewise accused of witchcraft and of carrying about him the figure of a skeleton, a potent agent, as it is asserted, in the operations of the black art. But one of the best and most unquestionable proofs of our assertion may be found in the so-called Museo Gregor Gregoriano, on the sarcophagus, which is paneled with bas-reliefs representing the miracles of Christ, may be seen the full figure of Jesus, who is 
in the resurrection of Lazarus, appears beardless and equipped with a wand in the received guise of a necromancer, whilst the corpse of Lazarus is swathed in bandages exactly as an Egyptian mummy. Hmm. Had posterity been enabled to have several such representations executed during the first century, when the figure, dress, and everyday habits of the reformer were still fresh in the memory of his contemporaries, perhaps the Christian world would be more Christ-like. The dozens of contradictory, groundless, and utterly meaningless speculations about the Son of Man would have been impossible, and humanity would now have but one religion and one God. It is this absence of all proof, the lack of the least productive clue about him who Christianity has deified, that has caused the present state of perplexity. No pictures of Christ were possible until after the days of Constantine, when the Jewish element was nearly eliminated among the followers of the new religion. The Jews, apostles, and disciples, whom the Zoroastrians and the Parsis have inoculated with a holy horror of any form of images, would have considered it a sacrilegious blasphemy to represent in any way or shape their master. The only authorized image of Jesus, even in the days of Tertullian, was an allegorical representation of the Good Shepherd, which was no portrait, but the figure of a man with a jackal head, like Anubis. On this gem, as seen in the collection of Gnostic amulets, the Good Shepherd bears upon his shoulders the lost lamb. He seems to have a human head upon his neck, but, as King correctly observes, it only seems so to the uninitiated eye. On a closer inspection, he becomes the double-headed Anubis, having one head human, the other a jackal's, whilst his girdle assumes the form of a serpent, rearing aloft its crested head. This figure, as the author of the Gnostics, etc., had two meanings, one obvious for the Volga, and the other mystical and recognizable by the initiated alone. It was perhaps the signet of some chief teacher or apostle. This affords a fresh proof that the Gnostics and early Orthodox Christians were not so wide apart in their secret doctrine. King deduces from a quotation from Epiphanes that even as late as 400 AD, it was considered an atrocious sin to attempt to represent the bodily appearance of Christ. Epiphanes brings it as an idolatrous charge against the Carpocratians that they kept a painted portraits and even gold and silver images and in other materials which they pretended to be portraits of Jesus and made by Pilate after the likeness of Christ. These they kept in secret along with Pythagoras, Plato, and Aristotle and getting them all up together they worship and offer sacrifices unto them after the Gentiles' fashion. What would the pious Epiphanes say were he to resuscitate and step into St. Peter's Cathedral at Rome? <clears throat> there is a lot of idolatry there. Ambrosius seems also very desperate at the idea that some persons fully credited the statement of Lampridius that Alexander Severus had in his private chapel an image of Christ among other great philosophers. That the pagans should have preserved the likeness of Christ, he exclaims, but the disciples have neglected to do so, is a notion the mind shudders to entertain, much less to believe. All this points, undeniably, to the fact that except a handful of self-styled Christians who subsequently won the day, all the civilized portion of the pagans who knew of Jesus honored him as a philosopher, an adept whom they placed on the same level with Pythagoras, Pythagoras and Apollonius. Whence, such a veneration on their part for a man, were he simply, as represented by the synoptics, a poor, unknown Jewish carpenter from Nazareth? As an incarnated god, there is no single record of him on this earth capable of withstanding the critical examination of science. As one of the greatest reformers, an inveterate enemy of every theological dogmatism, a persecutor of bigotry, a teacher of one of the most sublime codes of ethics. <clears throat> 
Jesus is one of the grandest and most clearly defined figures on the panorama of human history. His age may, with every day, be receding farther and farther back into the gloomy and hazy mist of the past, and his theology, based on human fancy and supported by untenable dogmas, may, nay, must, with every day, lose more of its unmerited prestige. Alone, the grand figure of the philosopher and moral reformer, instead of growing paler, will become with every century more pronounced and more clearly defined. It will reign supreme and universal only on that day when the whole of humanity recognizes but one father, the unknown one above and one brother, the whole of mankind below. That is where I am at. If you are unaware, I am a deist. Right? That is something that is fairly new to me as a concept. I didn't really... Like, I knew most of the religions, and I knew that there were people who believed in God without believing in any of the religions, but I didn't realize that there was a term for that, and that is deist, right? I believe in God, absolutely, 1,000%, fully and wholeheartedly. I worship the One. He who is, I was, and always shall be the creator and sustainer of the universe in all of its various forms. He is, literally, every single atom in existence. That's the Holy Spirit. And all of the space between those atoms, also the Holy Spirit. And you can take control of that. That is part of the manifestation process. But I believe in the deity. I don't believe in any of the intermediaries. Jesus was an intermediary. He was sent to be this, the place between man and God. I firmly and fully stand on both feet and with my full chest that you don't need an intermediary to intercede for you with God as a technical term. Now, you may need that in order to accept the fact that God does love you and that God will forgive you and that he wants the best things for you. You may need that intercession. That's why I don't hit Christianity as hard as it should be hit. Right? I am not out here to antagonize, although that may be changing. I am here to inform. God is real, and you do not have to believe in Jesus to believe that. That is the history of humanity. I understand fully that that is a unconventional belief and that it does have a tendency to step on toes. When I tell you that you can go directly to forgiveness for God, that sets people off in a way that nothing else does. It is really hard to have truth inserted into your illusion. <clears throat> in a pretended letter of Lentulius, a senator and distinguished historian to the Roman Senate, there is the description of the personal appearance of Jesus. The letter itself, written in horrid Latin, is pronounced a bare-faced forgery. But we find therein an expression which suggests many thoughts. Albeit a forgery, it is evident that who, whosoever invented it has nevertheless tried to follow tradition as closely as possible. The hair of Jesus is represented in it as wavy and curling, flowing down upon his shoulders, and as having a parting in the middle of the head after the fashion of the Nazarenes. The last sentence shows, one, that there was such a tradition based on the biblical description of John the Baptist, the Nazaria, and the custom of this sect. Two, had Lentellus been the author of this letter, it is difficult to believe that Paul should never have heard of it, and had he known its contents, he would never have pronounced it a shame for men to wear their hair long, thus shaming his Lord and Christ God. 3. If Jesus did wear his hair long and parted in the middle of the forehead after the fashion of the Nazarenes, as well as John, the only one of his apostles who followed it, then we have one good reason more to say that Jesus must have belonged to the sect of the Nazarenes, and been called Nasadia for this reason, and not because he was an inhabitant of Nazareth, for they never wore their hair long. The Nazarite, who separated himself unto the Lord, allowed no razor to come upon his head. He shall be holy, and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow, says Numbers 6, 5. Samson was a Nazarite. In example, vowed to the service of God, and in his hair was his strength. No razor shall come upon his head, 
the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. Judges 13.5 But the final and most reasonable conclusion to be inferred from this is that Jesus, who was so opposed to all the Orthodox Jewish practices, would not have allowed his hair to grow had he not belonged to this sect, which, in the days of John the Baptist, had already become a heresy in the eyes of the Sanhedrin. <clears throat> the Talmud, speaking of the Nazarea, or the Nazarenes, who had abandoned the world like the Hindu yogis or hermits, calls them a sect of physicians, of wandering exorcists, as also does Jervis. They went about the country living on alms and performing cures, Epiphanius says that the Nazarenes come next in heresy to the Corinthians, whether having existed before them or after them, nevertheless synchronous, and then adds that all Christians at that time were equally called Nazarenes. In the first remark made by Jesus about John the Baptist, we find him stating that he is Elias, which was for to come. This assertion, if it is not a later interpolation for the sake of having a prophecy fulfilled, means again that Jesus was a Kabbalist, unless indeed we have to adopt the doctrine of the French spiritist and suspect him of believing in reincarnation. Except the Kabbalistic sects of the Essenes, the Nazarenes, the disciples of Simeon ben Iochi and Hillel, neither the Orthodox Jews nor the Galileans believed or knew anything about the doctrine of permutation, and the Sadducees rejected even that of the resurrection. But the author of this Restitunius was Mosa, a master, upon whom be peace, who was the Revolutio, transmigration, of Seth and Hebel, that he might cover the nudity of his father Adam, Primus, says the Kabbalah. Thus, Jesus hinting that John was the Revolutio, or transmigration of Elias, seemed to prove beyond any doubt the school to which he belonged. Until the present day, uninitiated Kabbalists and Masons believe permutation to be synonymous with transmigration and metempsychosis. But they are as much mistaken in regard to the doctrine of the true Kabbalist as to that of the Buddhist. True, the Zohar says in one place, All souls are subject to transmigration. Men do not know the ways of the Holy One, blessed be He. They do not know that they are brought before the tribunal, both before they enter the world and after they quit it. And the Pharisees also held this doctrine, as Josephus shows, Antiquities 18.13. Also, the doctrine of Gilgal, held to the strange theory of the whirling of the soul, which taught that the bodies of the Jews, buried far away from the Holy Land, still preserve a particle of soil which can neither rest nor quit them until it reaches the soil of the Promised Land. And this whirling process was thought to be accomplished by the soul, being co conveyed back through an actual evolution of species, transmigrating from the minutest insect up to the largest animal. But this was an exoteric doctrine. We refer the reader to the Kabbalah de Nudata of Henry Kunrath. His language, however obscure, may to throw some light on the subject. But this doctrine of permutation, or revolutio, must not be understood as a belief in reincarnation. That Moses was considered the transmigration of Abel and Seth does not imply that the Kabbalists, those who were initiated at least, believe that the identical spirit of either of Adam's sons reappeared under the corporeal form of Moses. It only shows what was the mode of expression they used when hinting at one of the profoundest mysteries of the Oriental Gnosis, one of the most majestic articles of faith in the secret wisdom. It was purposely veiled, so as to half conceal and half reveal the truth. It implied that Moses, like certain other godlike men, was believed to have reached the highest of all states on earth, the rarest of all psychological phenomena, the perfect union with the immortal spirit, with the terrestrial duad, had occurred, 
the Trinity was complete, a God was incarnate. But how rare such incarnations. <clears throat> you are a tiny piece of God, but you are not a God. That is an important, very important distinction. That expression, ye are gods, which to our biblical students is mere abstraction, has for the Kabbalist a vital significance. Each immortal spirit that sheds its radiance upon a human being is a god. <laughs> the microcosmos of the macrocosmos, part and parcel of the unknown god, the first cause of which it is a direct em emanation. It is possessed of all the attributes of its parent source. Among these attributes are omniscience and omnipotence. Endowed with these, but yet unable to fully manifest them while in the body, during which time they are obscured, veiled, limited by the capabilities of physical nature, and thus divinely inhabited man may tower far above his kind, evince a godlike wisdom, and display deific powers. For while the rest of the mortals around him are but overshadowed by their divine self, with every chance given them to become immortal hereafter, but no other security than their personal efforts to win the kingdom of heaven. The so chosen man has already become an immortal while yet on earth. His prize is secured. Henceforth, he will live forever in eternal life. Not only he may have dominion over all the works of creation by employing the excellence of the name, the ineffable one, but be higher in this life, not, as Paul is made to say, a little lower than the angels. The ancients never entertained this sacrilegious thought that such perfected entities were incarnations of the one supreme and forever invisible God. No such profanation of the awful majesty entered into their conceptions. Moses and his antitypes and types were to them but complete men, God on earth, gods on earth, for their gods, divine spirits, had entered onto their hollow tabernacles, their purified physical bodies. The disembodied spirits of the heroes and sages were termed gods by the ancients. Hence, the accusation of polytheism and idolatry on the part of those who were the first to anthropomorphize the holiest and purest abstractions of their forefathers. The real and hidden sense of this doctrine was known to all the initiates. The Tanaim imparted it to their elect ones, the Isarim to the sol in the solemn solitudes of crypts and deserted places. It was one of the most esoteric and jealously guarded, for human nature was the same then as it is now, and the sacerdotal caste as confident as now in the supremacy of its knowledge and ambitions of, of ascendancy over the weaker masses, with the difference, perhaps, that its higher fans could prove the legitimacy of their claims and the plausibility of their doctrines, whereas now believers must be content with blind faith. While the Kabbalists call this mysterious and rare occurrence of the union of spirit with the mortal charge entrusted to its care, the descent of the angel Gabriel, the latter being a kind of generic name for it, the messenger of life, and the angel Metatron. And while the Nazarenes turn the same, Abel Zivo, the Delegatus, sent by the Lord of Celestitude, and it was universally known as the Anointed Spirit. Thus, it is the acceptation of this doctrine which caused the Gnostics to maintain that <coughs> sorry, Jesus was a man, overshadowed by the Christos, or Messenger of Life, and that his despairing cry from the cross Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, was wrung from him at the instant when he felt that his inspiring presence had finally abandoned him. For, as some affirmed, his faith had also abandoned him when on the cross. The early Nazarenes, who must be numbered among the Gnostic sects, believing that Jesus was a prophet, held... Nevertheless, in relation to him, the same doctrine of the divine overshadowing of certain men of God, sent for the salvation of nations, and to recall them to the path of righteousness. 
The divine mind is eternal, says the Codex, and it is pure light and poured out through splendid and immense space, Pleroma. It is the genetrix of the eons, but one of them went to matter, chaos, staring up confused, turbulentos, movements, and by a sudden portion of heavenly light fashioned it, properly constituted for use and appearance, but the beginning of every evil. The demiurge of matter claimed divine honor. Therefore Christus, the anointed, the prince of the eons, powers, was sent, expiritus, who, taking it on the person of the most devout Jew, Aisu, was to conquer him, but who, having laid it, the body, aside, departed on high. We will explain further on the full significance of the name Christos, and its mystic meaning. <clears throat> and now, in order to make such passages as the above more intelligible, we will endeavor to define, as briefly as possible, the dogmas in which, with very trifling differences, nearly all the Gnostic sects believed. It is in Ephesus that flourished in those days the greatest college, wherein the abstruse oriental speculations and the Platonic philosophy were taught in conjunction. It was a focus of the universal secret doctrines, the weird laboratory whence, fashioned in ancient Greek, Grecian phraseology, sprang the quintessence of Buddhistic, Zoroastrian, and Chaldean philosophy. Artemis, the giant concrete symbol of theosophico-pantheistic abstractions, the great mother, Multimama, androgyny, and patress of the Ephesian writings, was conquered by Paul. But although the zealous converts of the apostles pretended to burn all their books on curious arts, enough of these remained for them to study when the first zeal had cooled off. It is from Ephesus that nearly that spread nearly all of the gnosis which antagonized so fiercely with the Iranian dogmas, and still it was Ephesus, with their numerous collateral branches of the great college of the Essenes, which proved to be the hotbed of all the Kabbalistic speculations brought by the Tanaim for the cap from the captivity. In Ephesus, says Matter, the nations of the Jewish-Egyptian school and the semi-Persian speculations of the Kabbalists had then recently come to swell the vast conflux of Grecian and Asiatic doctrines, so there is no wonder that teachers should have sprung up there who strove to combine the religion newly preached by the Apostle with the ideas there so long established. <clears throat> Had not the Christians burdened themselves with the revelations of a little nation and accepted the Jehovah of Moses, the Gnostic ideas would never have been termed heresies. Once relieved of their dogmatic exaggerations, the world would have had a religious system based on pure Platonic philosophy and surely something would then have been gained. Now, let us see what are the greatest heresies of the Gnostics. We will select Basileides as the standard for our comparisons, for all the founders of other Gnostic sects group up round him, like a cluster of stars borrowing light from their sun. Basilides maintained that he had all his doctrine from the Apostle Matthew, and from Peter through Glaucus, the disciple of the latter. According to Esuius, he published 24 volumes of interpretations upon the Gospels, all of which were burned, a fact which makes us suppose that they contained more truthful matter than the school of Arrhenius was prepared to deny. He asserted that the unknown, eternal, and uncreated Father Having first brought forth nous, or mind, the latter emanated from itself, the Logos. The Logos, the word of John, emanated in its turn phronesis, or the intelligences, divine human spirits. From phronesis sprung Sophia, or feminine wisdom, and dynamis, strength. These were the personified attributes of the mysterious Godhead, the Gnostic Quinternian, typifying the five spiritual but unintelligible substances, personal virtues, or beings external to the unknown Godhead. This is preeminently a Kabbalistic idea, 
and it is still more Buddhistic. The earliest system of the Buddhistic philosophy, which preceded by far Gautama Buddha, is based upon the uncreated substance of the unknown, the Adi Buddha. This eternal, infinite monad possesses, as proper to its own essence, five acts of wisdom. <clears throat> From these, it, by five separate acts of Dhyan, emitted five Dhyani Buddhas. These, like Adi Buddha, are quinescent in their system, passive. Neither Adi nor either of the five Dhyani Buddhas were ever incarnated, but seven of their emanations became avatars. In example, were incarnated on this earth. Describing the Basildean system, Arrhenius, quoting from the Gnostics, declares as follows. When the uncreated, unnamed father saw the corruption of mankind, he sent his firstborn, Nous, into the world in the form of Christ for the redemption of all who believe in him out of the power of those who fabricated the world, the Demiurgus and his six sons, the planetary genie. He appeared amongst men as the man, Jesus, and wrought miracles. This Christ did not die in person, but Simeon the Cyrenian suffered in his stead, to whom he lent his bodily form. For the divine power, the noose of the Eternal Father, is not corporeal and cannot die. Whoso, therefore, maintains that Christ has died is still the bondsman of ignorance, who denies the same, he is free, and hath understood the purpose of the Father. I don't deny that he died, I don't know either way. I don't think that his death had the significance that is attributed to it, and so that amounts to pretty much the same thing, I think. <clears throat> So far, and taken in its abstract sense, we do not see anything blasphemous in this system. It may be a heresy against the theology of Arrhenius and Tertullian, but there is certainly nothing sacrilegious against the religious idea itself, and it will seem to every impartial thinker far more consistent with divine reverence than the anthropomorphism of actual Christianity. That is true. Jesus told you himself, you can blaspheme me, but don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. There's a reason why he said that. The Gnostics were called by the Orthodox Christian, Docate, or Illusionist, for believing that Christ did not, nor could, suffer death actually in physical body. The latter Brahmanical books contain, likewise, much that is repugnant to the reverential feeling and idea of the divinity. And, as well as the Gnostics, the Brahmins explain such legends as may shock the divine dignity of the spiritual beings called gods by attributing them to maya, or illusion. A people brought up and nurtured for countless ages among all the psychological phenomena of which the civilized nations read, but reject as incredible and worthless, cannot well expect to have its religious system even understood, let alone appreciated. <clears throat> the profoundest and most transcendental speculations of the ancient metaphysicians of India and other countries are all based on that great Buddhistic and Brahmanical principle underlying the whole of their religious metaphysics. Illusion of the senses. Everything that is finite is an illusion. All that which is eternal and infinite is reality. Form, color, that which we f hear and feel, or see with our mortal eyes, exists only so far as it can be conveyed to each of us through our senses. The universe, for a man born blind, does not exist in either form or color, but it exists in its privation, in the Aristotelian sense, and is a reality for the spiritual senses of the blind man. We all live under the powerful dominion of fantasy. Alone, the highest and invisible originals emanated from the thought of the unknown are real and permanent beings, forms, and ideas. On earth, we see but their reflections, more or less correct and ever dependent on the physical and mental organization of the person who beholds them. Ages untold before our era, Hindu mystic Kapila, who is considered by many scientists as a skeptic because they judge him with their habitual superficiality, 
magnificently expressed this idea in the following terms. <clears throat> man, physical man, counts for so little that hardly anything can demonstrate to him his proper existence and that of nature. Perhaps that which we regard as the universe and the diverse beings which seem to compose it have nothing real and are but the product of the continued illusion, maya, of our senses. And the modern Schopenhauer, repeating this philosophical idea, 10,000 years old now, says, Nature is non-existent per se. Nature is the infinite illusion of our senses. Kant, Schelling, and other metaphysicians have said the same, and their school maintains the idea. The objects of sense, being ever delusive and fluctuating, cannot be a reality. Spirit alone is unchangeable, hence, alone is no illusion. This is pure Buddhist doctrine. The religion of the Gnosis, knowledge, the most evident offshoot of Buddhism, was utterly based on this metaphysical tenet. Christos suffered spiritually for us, and far more acutely than did the illusionary Jesus, while his body was being tortured on the cross. All right, we're going to stop, pause for just a minute and talk about reality, because this is in part absolutely true. You don't actually see anything. We talk about this often on this channel, but you may be new here. You don't see anything. You see the reflection of things. Doesn't matter what it is unless you are looking directly at a light source, which is a bit painful. Even the immediate surroundings of the light source, you're not really seeing that, right? The globe of the bulb, you're not seeing that. The incandescence and within it, that you can see. It is the direct emanation of the light. Everything else is a reflection of the light. And not only that, but it is a reflection of the absence of that particular color. I use this phone all the time. It is blue, right? This, this color is blue. There is no blue in this phone. It is instead the absence of blue, which allows the light to reflect blue back. Everything else is absorbed. So all of the colors except blue are in this particular phone. So what you see is actually the photo negative of reality. That doesn't mean that it's not reality. It is still very real that this phone exists. We play by the corporeal rules of incorporation. We are here on a voluntary basis. This is not a prison planet. It may, however, be a simulation. But if it is a simulation, we still have the rules of the simulation to play by. Those rules are this, right? You don't actually ever touch anything. I am not actually touching this phone right now. What I am doing is being held off by the magnetic repulsion of the atoms in this phone from the atoms in my finger. You don't ever actually touch a thing. You merely get really, really close to it. So close, in fact, that the electromagnetic emanations that hold you together and the electromagnetic emanations that hold it together are working in close coordination with each other to give the illusion of holding the phone. But regardless, the phone is in my hand. Whether I'm actually touching it or not, the phone actually exists. You can actually call me on my phone if you have my number. Some of you do. You can alter reality to a certain degree. There are things that you can do that can change actual reality. But to the best of my knowledge and my experience, I cannot form this phone into a white case just by thinking it, wishing it, and hoping it. I cannot alter this in that manner. It is bound by the laws of incorporation to be the color that it is agreed upon being. It is <clears throat> a, a very important distinction there, right? While nothing is actually real, everything is actually real. All of these things are here for the purpose of incorporation, and they are part of the rules by which we play in incorporation. <clears throat> you are here for a reason, for a purpose, and being born blind, if you are blind, doesn't alter the fact that this is the absence of blue, reflecting blue back to my redness. It doesn't change that. It just changes your ability to see that. Your perception of things 
operates in the exact same way. If you see this as a prison planet, then all of your perceptions will be geared towards seeing prison planet in everything. If you, however, understand that there are rules in incorporation, and that as long as you play within the rules of incorporation, which are the eight laws of creation, by the way, you can greatly affect your incorporated experience. I have, as we have talked about several times through this study, healed myself. Me talking to you in this tone of voice is part of that. I have other healings going on within me, part of which I have revealed here, but the real revelation on most of that is still waiting to come. But through the meditative practices and the beliefs that I have and the viewpoint that I hold on life and the actual dedication to do the prayer, fasting, meditation, and yes, magic, I have affected change within my corporeal body. I have affected the temple. I have had a small measure of control outside of myself. I have affected the wa wa blah, 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 affected the weather on at least one occasion, and I felt the repercussions from it, so I don't play with it anymore. But I did that. I, I have affected things both within myself and without of myself. And as long as I am playing by the a laws of creation, which are the foundational concepts which hold reality together, as long as I am playing by the eight laws of creation, I can affect change. You can do the same thing, but I cannot affect you and not affect the repercussions of what it is, right? So if I go and non-consensually heal you, that is a problem on a karmic level. If you, however, give consent, I can affect you. Affecting things on a grand scale will bite you in the butt. Trust me on this one. It is one of the eight laws of creation and one that has given me much grief over the years. And so I wanted to touch briefly on reality because I don't know that we have done that in this particular study. And you may only be here for this particular study. So in part, their conceptualization of this is absolutely true. Nothing is real. But in part, it is absolutely untrue. Everything is real. Those are both true and untrue at the same time. And I understand that is a difficult concept to wrap your head around, but life is experiential. You are here for the experience of life. And part of that is the rules by which we play. Too many people get caught up in this. It's an illusion. It is not real. And they think that they can affect things that they can't or shouldn't. And that is an extremely large problem within the entirety of this community of which I am a part called spirituality, right? I am doing magic. That is setting me apart from a great number of people, but most of the people who claim to be doing magic, I am set apart from them as well. I'm not out here trying to influence in the way that we see these other people do. The Wiccans, I'm quite intimately familiar with the, the Wiccans and what they stand for. The neo-paganism, uh, all of those things I understand greatly because I used to practice them. And I understand that most of them are doing it to be contrary. They are not doing it through actual faithful service of the actual idea behind which they are congealing themselves. <clears throat> And so this is in part a call out for the philosophers and for those who are practicing magic. You're doing it wrong. All right. In the idea of the Christians, Christ is but another name for Yeshua. The philosophy of the Gnostics, the initiates, the hierophants understood it otherwise. The word Christos like all Greek words, must be sought in its filiological origin, the Sanskrit. In this latter language, Chris means sacred, and the Hindu deity was named Krishna, the pure, or the sacred, from that. On the other hand, the Greek, Greek Christos bears several meanings, as anointed, pure oil, chrism, and others. 
in all languages, through this, though the synonym of the word means pure or sacred essence, it is the first emanation of the invisible Godhead manifesting itself tangibly in spirit. We're going to pause here and talk about the oil. There is another teacher out there, I'm not going to call his name, but you can find him, who talks an awful lot about the Christios oil. Now, on first inspection of his content, I was like, yeah, he seems to be on to something. But I'm not entirely sure that he is on to the correct something because of a lot of the things that he holds on to that I know to be pretty much untrue. Now, the main tenet in which he is talking about is referring to the Christos as the oil that is secreted within yourself that allows the spiritual experience. And that is the true part. You can, through the ways that I talk about in the Infinite Integrations playlist, take the energy which is available to you as the Holy Spirit and move it within yourself. Part of that moving it within yourself is how I have healed myself. And part of it is activating this oil. This is secreted from your third eye, right? The pineal gland, which is not here in the front of your forehead, although part of it extends most of the way there. The actual energetic emanations of this gland are about the size of your fist. And they start, and if you put your fingers just in front of your ears, above and just in front, slightly behind the indention of the temple, right? And you draw a line between those, and then you go directly between the eyes, and you go where the skull comes down in kind of a V shape in the back of your head. And you draw a line between those. The intersection of that is the pineal gland. That is the third eye, and that is where this oil comes from. You can, through the manipulation of the electromagnetic forces of creation, which is the Holy Spirit, release that oil within yourself. That oil contains dimethyltryptoline, which is DMT. You can literally, physically trigger this oil to alter your actual reality. It can be done in a variety of ways, but one of those ways he describes and one of those ways I describe. I do it through the energetic manipulations. I don't do it necessarily through fasting. I don't rely upon one day of the month or one week of the month in which to do it. I can do it whenever I want to. It is, can be to a greater and lesser degree. So there can be a small alteration of the reality or a great alteration of the reality. And your intentionality plays a large part in that. For the most part, I do not partake in the great alteration of reality. I use very little bit of that oil and I alter the way that I see the life, the reality in which we are in, the structure of the simulation, if you care to look at it that way, becomes more mutable when that oil is active. But the more oil that is active, the less you are able to control the mutability of reality. So I don't use a lot of it, right? I trigger just a little bit, just enough to make my vision do the thing that it is to do. If you have ever partaken of psychedelics, that is what happens. I don't need mushrooms to enter that state. I don't need to go to some tribe and drink the boiled root of a tree tied with the, the plant and the flower of another in order to trigger this. It is something that I can do internally for myself. I don't need those experiences. I will probably partake in them at some point farther along the path because I firmly believe that if you are opening that particular door with chemicals and you are not prepared in the correct manner, it can be extremely overwhelming and detrimental to your spiritual experience. Most people who have the experience are not prepared, even on a superficial level for what they see on the other side. Almost all of them are changed. Most of them are positively changed, I will grant that. But I firmly believe that taking these chemicals in order to have the spiritual experience is detrimental to your actual growth in a spiritual manner because you can do it without the chemicals. 
You do not need the artificial key to the door. You have the correct key already. The problem is that my way takes more dedication. It takes more effort. Yes, you have to fast before you drink the ayahuasca, but that is not dedication. That is you doing something for a direct effect, and yes, you will do it. Do you have that same energy if you are not going to be doing this? Can you fast without it? Can you pray and meditate and fast in the manner that is necessary to free these things for yourself? That is the part that is missing in these ayahuasca experiences, and I don't care how long they've been doing it. I don't care how many different cultures do it. I do not care in the slightest. Just because something has been done a very long time does not make it correct. And the fact that most of the people who are partaking of this substance do not have the growth on the other side of it. There is a change in almost every, exa in every example, but it is not always necessarily for the betterment you believe in new things and it strips away a lot of the old things and that's good but there's a lot of people out there going to seek these entities to talk to them and that's a problem there are good entities there are bad entities we have talked about that through this whole series so i'm not going to dive into it too much but there are entities aligned for the betterment of mankind and for the detriment of mankind and you don't know what you're getting, especially if you're in an altered state that you did not trigger. That's a problem. That is the problem with these purple entities. That is the problem with these multi-armed entities that people go and they talk to. And then they find out things and they're not prepared for it. <clears throat> Back to the text. The Greek Logos, the Hebrew Messiah, and the Latin Veterbum. And the Hindu Viraj, the sun, are identically the same. They represent the idea of collective entities, of flames detached from one eternal center of light. The man who accomplishes pious but interested acts with the sole object of his salvation may reach the ranks of the divas, saints, but he who accomplishes disinterestedly the same pious acts finds himself ridden forever of the five elements of matter. Perceiving the supreme soul in all beings and all beings in the supreme soul, in offering his own soul in sacrifice, he identifies himself with the being who shines in his own splendor. Manu, Book 12, Slokas 90 and 91. And that is in part talking about what I just said. Right? If you accomplish the pious but interested acts with the sole object of his salvation, you may reach Davis, right? If you are doing the things in the correct manner, then you may reach this. But he who accomplishes disinterestedly the same pious acts finds himself ridden forever of the five elements. That is a restating of my just little rant a minute ago. Thus, Christos as a unity is but an abstraction a general idea representing the collective aggregation of the numberless spirit entities, which are the direct emanations of the infinite, invisible, incomprehensible first cause. The individual spirits of men erroneously called the souls. And see, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have severe exception to that too, right? We are here for a purpose, and that purpose is growth, learning, and lessons. The way that we achieve that is through our individual incorporation. We have the body, which is the temple of God. We have the Holy Spirit, which is the all-encompassing everything that is, the part that turns the now into the next. And then we have the souls. The souls are the tiny individualized piece of God that is you. So call it erroneous if you want to, but it is the reality of what is. There is the body, the soul, and the spirit. Those are the three parts of the Trinity. That is the foundational conception of our reality. And that is, indeed, the spirit of men. They are the divine sons of God, of which 
Some only overshadow mortal men, but this, the majority, some remain forever planetary spirits, and some, the smaller and rare minority, unite themselves during life with some men. Now, I am going to say again, you open yourself up to these entities. Whether you intend to or not, whenever you partake of these chemical substances and artificially create the reality change, you are opening yourself up to possession. That is one of the foundational problems with the psychoactives. You do the same thing, if you were unaware, whenever you are doing meditative practices. If you are astral projecting and you have not taken precautions, you can be inhabited. That is always, without exception, a bad thing. Every single time that there is a spirit inhabiting a soul or a temple that is not the individualized piece that was assigned to that body, it is wrong. Every single time, regardless of who it is or their intentions, you are not divine. You are a tiny sliver of divinity, right? The, the soul... That is divine, but it is a piece of God, not God. Such godlike beings as Gautama Buddha, Jesus, Tisu, Krishna, and a few others had united themselves with their spirits permanently. Hence, they became gods on earth. I stand exactly where I just stated. Others, such as Moses, Pythagoras, Apollonius, Plotinus, Confucius, Plato, Iamblichus, and some Christian saints, having at intervals been so united, have taken rank in history as demigods and leaders of mankind. When unburdened of their terrestrial tabernacles, their freed souls, henceforth united forever with their spirits, rejoin the whole shining host which is bound together in one spiritual solidarity of thought and deed and called the anointed hence the meaning of the gnostics who by saying that christos suffered spiritually for humanity implied that his divine spirit suffered mostly i've already expressed what i need to on that so such and far more elevating were the ideas of marcion the great heresiarch of the second century as he is termed by his opponents he came to rome towards the latter part of the half century from a.d 139 to 142 according to, to tertullian arrhenius clemens and most of his modern commentators such as bunsen tischendorf westcott and many others credner and schielermacher agree as to his high and irreproachable personal character his pure religious aspirations and elevated views his influence must have been powerful as we find epiphanus writing more than two centuries later that in his time the followers of marcion were to be found throughout the whole world the danger must have been pressing and great indeed if we are to judge it to have been proportioned with the appropriate bias epithets and vituperation heaped upon marcion by the great african that patristic cerebus whom we find ever barking at the door of the iranian dogmas we have but to open his celebrated refutation of marcion's antithesis to acquaint ourselves with the fine fleur of monkish abuse of the christian school an abuse so faithfully carried through the Middle Ages to be renewed again in our present day at the Vatican. Now, then, ye hounds, yelping at the God of truth whom the apostles cast out to all your questions, these are the bones of contention which ye gnaw, etc. The poverty of the great African arguments keeps pace with his abuse, remarks the author of Supernatural Religion. There, the fathers, Religious controversy bristles with statements and is turbid with pious abuse. Tertullian was a master of his style and the vehement vituperation with which he opens and often interlauds his work against the impious and sacrilegious Marcion offers anything but a guarantee of fair and legitimate criticism. 
how firm these two fathers, Tertullian and Epiphanes, were on their theological ground may be inferred from the curious fact that they intemperately, both vehemently, reproach the beast, Marcion, with erasing passages from the Gospel of Luke, which were never were in Luke at all. The lightness and inaccuracy, as the critic, with which Tertullian proceeds are all better illustrated by the fact that not only does he accuse Marcion falsely, but he actually defines the motives for which he expunged a passage which never existed. In the same chapter, he also similarly accuses Marcion of erasing, from Luke, the saying that Christ had not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them and he actually repeats the charge on two other occasions. Epiphanes also commits the mistake of reproaching Marcion with omitting from Luke what is only found in Matthew. Having so far shown the amount of reliance to be placed in the patristic literature, and it being unanimously conceded by the great majority of biblical critics that what the fathers fought for was not the truth, but their own interpretations and unwarranted assertions. We will now proceed to state what were the views of Marcion, who Tertullian desired to annihilate as the most dangerous heretic of his day. If we are to believe Hilgenfeld, one of the greatest German biblical critics, then, from the critical standing point, one must consider the statements of the fathers of the church only as expressions of their subjective view, which itself requires proof. We can do no better nor make a more correct statement of facts concerning Marcion than by quoting what our space permits from the supernatural religion, the author of which bases his assertions on the evidence of the two great of the greatest critics, as well as on his own researches. He shows in the days of Marcion two broad parties in the primitive church, one considering Christianity a mere continuation of the law and dwarfing it into an Israelite institution, a narrow sect of Judaism, the other representing the glad tidings as the introduction of a new system applicable to all and supplanting the mosaic dispensation of the law by a universal dispensation of grace. These two parties, he adds, were popular, popularly represented in the early church by the two apostles Peter and Paul, and their antagonism is faintly revealed in the epistle to the Galatians. Marcion, who recognized no other gospels than a few epistles of Paul, who rejected totally the anthropomorphism of the Old Testament, and drew a distinct line of demarcation between the old Judaism and Christianity, viewed Jesus neither as a king, Messiah of the Jews, nor the son of David, who was in any way connected with the law of the prophets, but the divine being sent to reveal to man a spiritual religion wholly new and a God of goodness and grace hitherto unknown. I do not hold that to be true at all. The Lord God of the Jews in his eyes, the creator, Demiurgos, was totally different and distinct from the deity who had sent Jesus to reveal the divine truth and preach the glad tidings to bring reconciliation and salvation to all. The mission of Jesus, according to Marcion, was to abrogate the Jewish Lord, who was opposed to the God and the Father of Jesus Christ as matter is the spirit in purity to purity. Was Marcion so far wrong? Was it blasphemy or was it intuition? Divine inspiration in him to express that which every honest art yearns, yearning for truth, more or less feels and acknowledges. If, in his sincere desire to establish a purely spiritual religion, a universal faith based on unadulterated truth, he found it necessary to make of Christianity an entirely new and separate system from that of Judaism. Did not Marcion have the very words of Christ for his authority? No man put the piece of new cloth into an old garment, for the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. 
but they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. In what particular does the jealous, wrathful, revengeful God of Israel resemble the unknown deity, the God of mercy preached by Jesus, his Father who is in heaven, and the Father of all humanity? This Father alone is God of spirit and purity, and to compare him with the subordinate and capricious cyanatic deity is an error. I fully believe that. I, I stand on that. If you can go back to Genesis and Exodus, where we have talked about this in some great detail, that Moses was serving the wrong entity, that any time that there is a blood sacrifice required, you are serving the wrong entity. And so most of the patriarchs in the Bible were actually serving something not correct. Did Jesus ever pronounce the name of Jehovah? Did he ever place his father in contrast with the severe and cruel judge? His God of mercy, love, and justice with the Jewish genius of retaliation? Never. From that memorial day when he preached his sermon on the mount, an immeasurable void opened between his God and that other deity who has fulminated his commands from that other mount, Sinai. We also have a separate area where Sinai is than where it is believed to be now, check back to Exodus and you can find that out. The language of Jesus is unequivocal. It implies not only rebellion, but defiance of the Mosaic Lord God. <clears throat> Ye have heard, he tells us, that it hath been said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn him the other also. Ye have heard that it hath been said by the same Lord God on Sinai, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Matthew 5. Now I hold also some contention here. You should, in most cases, indeed, turn the other cheek. <clears throat> but there are times when that is not a reality. If you are dealing with a situation with someone who is antagonistic and has no recourse but antagonism towards you, then you have no choice whatsoever except to defend yourself. You do not have to allow someone to kill you to be holy and pious. You should not be going out seeking the ability to strike anyone, right? That is not something that should be in your goals. But if someone is striking you, lay them on the ground. Period. The end. Don't go above and beyond. Don't try to kill them or permanently maim them. But absolutely, you are empowered, required to stop that. It is not something that you have to to tolerate at all in any capacity whatsoever. You do not have to be a victim. And this, this is victimhood, right? I hold some severely different beliefs. I understand that it is unconventional. There is time, most of the time, to just turn the cheek, walk away, not in, or not aggrieve the other person, don't... Uh, exasperate this situation if possible at all turn around leave don't stand there and let them hit you on the other cheek that is dumb that is part of the same keep them in servitude that is the theme for these control systems right the control systems were put in place to control your actions part of that is to make you humble and meek so that people who are not can take advantage of you, right? That is why we had slavery. That is why we had the serf classes. That is why we had nobility. This was to keep you subservient to that, this whole thing. Should you be going about your business to the best of your ability peacefully? Absolutely. Should it be to your detriment? Should you turn the other cheek? No. You can walk away, but do not allow someone to keep striking you. 
That is antithetical to your purpose. And now, open Manu and read. Resignation, the action of rendering good for evil, temperance, probity, purity, repression of the senses, the knowledge of the sastras, the holy books, that of the supreme soul, truthfulness, and abstinence from anger. Such are the ten virtues in which consist duty. Those who study these ten precepts of duty, and after having studied them conform their lives thereto, will reach the supreme condition. And again, I am going to take extreme exception. Right? Resignation. Be resigned to whatever happens? No. You are an active participant in this voluntary existence. You get to have your own abilities. You get to have your own wants, needs, desires, and the, the capacity to carry that out. The action of rendering good for evil. Some cases that is absolutely a thing. If someone is acting out of bounds because they have been abused, absolutely show compassion. But you don't have to tolerate evil just because you were good. That doesn't mean to go out and smite the infidels. That is not what I am saying. I am saying protect you and yours. Temperance. We talk about temperance all the time. There are seven virtues and there are seven vices, right? Temperance is the expression of the opposite of gluttony. Right? Gluttony is consuming everything with no regard to anything. And uh, temperance, in it is extreme, is the denial of self of everything to the exclusion of everything. You are not meant to be either one of those, right? You are not meant to exclude yourself from all things. But you are meant to be temperate. You can have a drink or two. Don't drink the whole bottle. You can drink every once in a while. Don't drink every day, right? That is temperance in its primal form, the way that it should be, the balance between the two, the virtue and the vice. It is the same for all of the virtues and the vices. And anger is the opposite of love. So you are meant to give love. Absolutely. You're meant to show love as much as you possibly can. But there is a time for anger as well. Again, walk away if you can, but don't let them strike you on the cheek twice. Abstinence from anger is stupid. God gave you anger for a reason. It is to allow you to understand that this situation is not correct. And so you get mad. That does not mean that you have to strike out every time that you get mad. Learn moderation. Temperance. Right? Purity. The repression of the senses. Again, no. Right? You are not meant to be fully chaste and never have sex. That is not the intention of the incorporation. It can be for some very few select people who are on that particular path, right? There is a path for pretty much all of it. But for the most part, for almost everyone, you are meant to feel love. You are meant to have sex. You are meant to find love and have sex with them. That is how it's supposed to work. It is a natural biological imperative to spread your seed or have your seed spread to you. That is a biological imperative. Do you think God put it in you as a mistake? Is that what you believe? That lust is a horrible, sinful thing? I lust after my wife so much. I will love that woman. She is the best woman on the planet. And I find her sexier than any other woman on the planet. I don't care about the other women. I lust after my wife. And that is not a bad thing. There is nothing wrong with that whatsoever. I have pride in my accomplishments, but I am not so prideful as to believe that I am correct in everything, despite what it may seem like here. The balance between the virtues and the vices is the goal. Not the exclusion of all the vices. Not the acceptance of all the virtues. The balance between them. That is where you were meant to live. And there are seven, not ten. <clears throat> Back to the text. If Manu did not trace these words many thousands of years before they are of Christianity, at least no voice in the whole world would them, deny them a less antiquity than several centuries B.C. The same in the case of the precepts of Buddhism. Sorry, there's cayenne in this, and sometimes it can be a little bit hard to get down. <laughs> 
If we turn to the Pratimakoska Sutra and other religious tracts of the Buddhist, we read the following, the ten following commandments. Thou shalt not kill any living creature. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not break thy vow of chastity. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not betray the secrets of others. Thou shalt not wish for the death of thy enemies. Thou shalt not desire the wealth of others. Thou shalt not pronounce injurious and foul words. Thou shalt not indulge in luxury. Sleep in soft beds or be lazy. And thou shalt not accept gold or silver. That is stupid. That is stupid. I'm, I'm just going to put it out there like that. I know that probably step on some toes. Thou shalt not kill any living creature. What about inadvertently? I'm walking through the grass and I step on a bug and I crush it. Does that condemn me to some eternal damnation? Right? I know. Buddhists don't exactly believe that. But that is the spirit that is being conveyed. You are not meant to live a life of exclusion. And that includes the eating of animals. I know. There's a lot of people that believe like, you can have a healthy lifestyle eating vegetarian. Not really. It takes an extreme amount of effort. There's a lot of people that believe you can make a diet completely out of nothing but carnivorous materials. That is stupid. You are not meant to live in a life of exclusion, either of meat or of plants. We are omnivores. We are meant to eat both of them. That is a very real fact and one of the rules of the incarnation that we're in. Should you kill anything arbitrarily? No. I go out of my way to save the life of insects. I do. And it's not because of this commandment. It is because it is simply the right thing to do. There is no need to be excessively cruel. And so I go out of my way to save spiders and flies. Right? Thou shalt not steal. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> that one right there is good. But thou shalt not break thy vow of chastity. Again, you're not meant to be chased. With very few exceptions, some people are built that way. That is real, just the same as some people are built for polygamy. Right? Most people, however, are built to have that one person. And they are meant to have that. It is not meant for you to be chased throughout your life. It's just simply not. Thou shalt not lie. Another good one. Thou shalt not betray the secrets of others. I'm 100% with that. Unless it is one of those secrets where I'm going to go and do harmful things to this person, but don't tell nobody. Absolutely tell. Absolutely tell every single time. But outside of that, you should not be betraying people. Period. Whether that is with fidelity or whether that is with secrets or whether that is monetarily, you should not be betraying people. Thou shalt not wish for the death of thy enemies. That is that is one of the eight laws of creation expressed. Thou shalt not desire the wealth of others. Again, thou shalt not pronounce injurious or foul words. That's a little bit weird, right? And I get the meaning behind it. You should not be antagonistic. We just spent an extensive amount of time talking about that, so we're not going to do it again. But this is part of that, that turn the other cheek mentality, right? Don't pronounce injurious or foul words. Now, sometimes it's a necessity. Sometimes there is a reason to do it. Sometimes that is the only way short of violence to stop something. That is real. You don't have to believe it. It is simply a fact. And so, again, no. Thou shalt not indulge in luxury. Oh my. Bruh. That really upsets me. It really does. Because this is victim mentality in its essence. Right? Everything that happens is external for me. I should not hold on to anything because everything will come to me is victim mentality. You may not see it that way, but it is. It is putting off the responsibility to God to provide for you instead of you going about your labors. Right? Now, this isn't saying don't work, but that's the intimation, because what are you going to do? Work for free for everyone? That is stupid. You are meant to have a house. You are meant to have somewhere safe to rest your head. That is a fundamental desire of every human. You are meant to accumulate things. Again, it is the balance between the two, right? Greed and charity being the same coin. You are meant to be in the middle of that. 
You're supposed to have things, accumulate things. I've got a house. I love it. But I do not love it to the exception of other people. I love it because it is protection for me, provided from God through the hard efforts of myself and my wife. That is why I love my house. I love my bed. It gives me great sleep. I love the food that I eat. Right? All of these are provisions. They have been given to me. Many people would consider them luxuries. I don't. I consider them necessities. You should have a house. You should have a soft bed. And occasionally, it's okay to be lazy. That should not be the fundamental principle of your life. I don't want to do anything. But you shouldn't be lazy either. You should be productively employed. And thou shalt not accept gold or silver is absolutely the dumbest fucking thing I've seen written in this entire study. And I, again, I don't care how long it's been a thing. That doesn't make it correct. God knows if nothing else, that is what I am here to break down. Good master, what shall I do that I may have eternal life? Ask a man of Jesus. Keep the commandments. Which thou shalt do no matter, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, is the answer. And again, you've already got eternal life. Here's the kicker for a lot of you Christians. The soul is eternal. It is. It's already eternal. You already have eternal life. Now, I believe, this is my belief, that it was somewhere prior to being in this temple, right? This soul was somewhere prior to being in this beat suit. Before I was in 5D space, I was way out there in AD space, part of the divine. And I came here with purpose and intention, voluntarily. Why well, will me, the soul, will leave this temple at some point. The temple will fade away and return to the elements, as we have seen repeated throughout this study. It will reconstitute itself into nature and then from there be assimilated into other forms of life. That is all true. But the soul is already eternal. It's already was somewhere prior to being here and going somewhere when it leaves here. There was no concept of hell in the Old Testament. Period. The end. It was not there. There was Sheol, which was the land of the dead, and that's where everybody went. There was not even a whole lot of speculation about what that meant. To me, that is a reunification with the actual divinity, the actual divine in AD space. It is entirely possible that I will come back for another incarnation, but it will not be in this body, right? The soul is already eternal. It can come back. It came here once. It can come back again. There's nothing to restrict that. The soul is already eternal. So what shall I do to have eternal life <laughs> exist? Now, what can I do to ensure that I have uh, rewards in the eternal life? Well, you can live a good life, but I really don't believe that there is a reward waiting on the other side. And I know that's a step too far for some people. Streets of gold where, you know, Gold, which doesn't matter, and you should be in poverty, that well, that's going to be everywhere. So it, it's perfectly fine that there's gold and silver and rubies and emeralds and diamonds all over this eternal city. That ain't got nothing to do with greed at all. Nothing. I believe that the reward is the return. Now, if you have lived a life full of terrible things, you're probably not going to like the reunitement with the divine. You're going to find out that you failed all of your lessons. Or if you've lived a holy and a pious life, you find out that you, you kept all of your lessons and you get the chance to not come back. I fully believe that and you don't have to. That is one of the things that we're not going to be able to prove. But it is my spiritual experience which has brought me to that. Right? It is not because I read it from someone else. It is because I have experienced something outside of the normal. And from that, I have investigated the things which I once believed, and I have found them to be untrue. And so I adjusted my beliefs in accordance with the experience that I had. I can relay that experience to you, but I can't give it to you. right? I can tell you about it, but I can't make you feel it. 
And so it is, until the end, going to be my opinion. This is their opinion. I hold contention with their opinion. doesn't mean that they're wrong. It doesn't mean that I'm right. But I do feel like I am right. What shall I do to obtain possession of Bodhi? Knowledge of eternal truth. Ask a disciple of his Buddhist master. What way is there to become a Nupasaka? Keep the commandments. What are they? Thou shalt abstain all thy life from murder, theft, adultery, and lying, answers the master. Identical injunctions, are they not? Divine injunctions, the living up to which would purify and exalt humanity. But are they more divine when uttered through one mouth than another? If it is godlike to return good for evil, does the enunciation of the precept by a Nazarene give it any greater force than its enunciation by an Indian or Tibetan philosopher? We see that the golden rule was not original with Jesus, that its birthplace was India. Do what we may, we cannot deny that Sakyamuni Buddha, a less remote antiquity than several centuries before the birth of Jesus, in seeking a model for his system of ethics, why should Jesus have gone to the foot of the Himalayans rather than the foot of Sinai, but that the doctrines of Manu and Gautama harmonized exactly with his own philosophy, while those of Jehovah were to him abhorrent and terrifying? The Hindus taught to return good for evil, but the Jehovistic command was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Would Christians, <clears throat> would Christians still maintain the identity of the Father of Jesus and Jehovah if evidence sufficiently clear could be adduced that the Lord God was no other than the pagan Bacchus Dionysus? Well, this identity of the Jehovah at Mount Sinai with the god Bacchus is hardly disputable. The name is Yava or Io, according to Theodoret, which is the secret name of the Phoenician mystery god, and it was actually adopted from the Chaldeans, with whom it was also the secret name of the Creator. Wherever Bacchus was worshipped, there was a tradition of Nysa in a cave where he was reared. Bethson, or Sithkopolis in Palestine, had that designation. So had a spot on Mount Parnassus. But Diodorus declares that Nysa was between Phoenicia and Egypt. Euripides states that Dionysus came from Greece from India, and Diodorus adds his testimony. Osiris was brought up in Nysa, in Arabia, the happy. He was the son of Zeus and was named from his father, nominative Zeus, genitive Dios, and the place Dionysios the Zeus or Yov of Nysa. This identity of, or of name or title is very significant. In Greece, Dionysus was second only to Zeus, and Pindar says, So Father Zeus governs all things, and Bacchus he governs also. But outside of Greece, Bacchus was the all-powerful. Zegrius, the highest of the gods, Moses seemed to have worshipped him personally and together with the populace at Mount Sinai. Unless we admit that he was an initiated priest and adept who knew how to lift the veil which hangs behind all such exoteric worship but kept the secret. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi or Io Nisi. What better evidence is required to show that the Sinatic God was indifferently Bacchus, Osiris, and Jehovah? Mr. Sharp appends his testimony that the place where Osiris was born was Mount Sinai, called by the Egyptians Mount Nisa. The brazen serpent was a niece, and the month of the Jewish Passover was Nisan. If the Mosaic Lord God, was the only living God and Jesus his only son, how account for the rebellious language of the latter? Without hesitation or qualification, he sweeps away the Jewish 
lex talionis, and substitutes for it the law of charity and self-denial. If the Old Testament is a divine revelation, how can the New Testament be? Are we required to believe and worship a deity who contradicts himself every few hundred years? Oh, it is much more common than that. <laughs> was Moses inspired or was Jesus not the Son of God? This is a dilemma from which the theologian are bond bound to rescue us. It is from this very dilemma that the Gnostics endeavored to snatch the budding Christianity. Justice has been waiting 19 centuries for intelligent commentators to appreciate the difference between the Orthodox Tertullian and Gnostic Marcion. The brutal violence, unfairness, and bigotry of the great African repulse all who accept his Christianity. How can a god, inquired Marcion, break his own commandments? Yes. How could he consistently prohibit idolatry and image worship, and still call Moses to set up the brazen serpent, which continued all the way up until relatively modern Israel? How command, thou shalt not steal, and then order the Israelites to spoil the Egyptians of their gold and silver? Anticipating the results of modern criticism, Marcion denies the apl applicability of Jesus of the so-called messianic prophecies, writes the author of Supernatural Religion. The Emmanuel of Isaiah is not Christ. The virgin, his mother, is simply a young woman, an alma of the temple, and the sufferings of the servant of God, Isaiah, are not predictions of the death of Jesus. That right there is the main thing that you need to take from this entire study. <laughs> not near, not really, but in large part, yes. Hopefully I brought a little bit of enlightenment and not too much confusion to a somewhat difficult topic. I understand that I hold some unconventional beliefs and that I have a tendency to step on toes when I relay those. It is not intentional, but it is not something I apologize for. It is important to note this last part. Right? We talk often about how, and most especially now, because it is December of the year 2024, and we are but days away from the pagan ritual of a Yule that we have termed Christmas. It is important to understand that there was no prophecy of a virgin birth in the Old Testament. That was not a thing. They did not believe it. They were not anticipating it. What actually happened was Isaiah went to the king and he's like, tell me the sign that you would like to have. And the king's like, whoa, I am not tempting God with that. And Isaiah says, fine, I will give you the sign. This young woman, the maiden, not a virgin, but a maiden, will give birth. And th that child will be eating curds by the time that you are hauled off into captivity. And then it happened exactly like that. Isaiah married that young woman, had a child with her, and when that child was eating curds, Babylon came and took him into captivity. That is what happened. It was nothing about a virgin birth, nothing about the redemption of the people, nothing at all as what has been portrayed. <clears throat> that is true of all the prophecies. At least the ones that we went through, right? We didn't go through, I don't think we went through Amos, and we didn't go through all of Hosea. I think we may have went through part of it. But we went through Isaiah, we went through Daniel, we went through most of the major prophets, and we talked in extensive detail in this Bible study about those things. Because they are foundationally a problem for Christianity. There were a lot of problems for Christianity contained in the Old Testament. Not the least of which is this, but in part, like, David was a horrible person all the way through the entirety of his life, all the way up until the point of death. David was a horrible person at best, possibly an entity or possessed by an entity at worst, almost certainly at least a bisexual with homosexual proclivities. Solomon was a... Uh, fratricide, right? He killed all of his brothers so that he could assume the throne and then claim that that was divine intervention. He literally made his money 
like the bulk of Solomon's money came from something that he was expressly denied the ability to do. It was stated by the prophets well before his time, like maybe even by Moses himself or Aaron, but when you have kings in the future, because they didn't then, those kings are expressly denied the ability to go to Egypt and buy horses and chariots. That was Solomon's main source of income. He was an arms dealer. He bought arms, chariots and horses from Egypt and the remnants of Midian and sold them for profit to the neighbors to the north who, by the way, took over his people shortly thereafter. There are a lot of reasons to doubt the veracity of the Old Testament. And the New Testament being built upon the bones of the Old Testament are equally broken. None of the prophecies that are attributed to calling for the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus are real. All of those prophecies are self-insertions of a later religion into the text of an older religion in order to subvert the meanings of those texts, like we just saw in Isaiah. As is pointed out by them in Isaiah, and as I point out all of the time about Isaiah. It is through this Bible study that I came to leave Christianity and to come to where I am at now. The path that I am on now, the fruits are love. The fruits are healing. The fruits are acceptance and growth. It is all positive fruits over here from the path that I am on now. But when I was on Christianity's path, those fruits were not the same. The healing that I am experiencing in very real ways are because of my falling off from this particular religion. Because of these regions. It is not uncommon to find within the same book, but often within the same chapter of the entirety of the Old Testament, contradictions to what they are saying within the book, right? Some of those are pointed out here. God can't break his own commandments. When he told him to raise up a brazen serpent and by looking at it, it would be healed. That was idolatry. You don't have to believe that, but it was, right? You can, you can formulate your beliefs based upon whatever you want. But the factual matter is, is that when they were amidst the serpents, God put a serpent on a stick and told them to look at it. And they did. And they worshiped that serpent according to the history in the Bible for hundreds of years. It held a place of honor in the temple of Solomon. A snake on a stick. Now, you can have an exoteric view of that. You can have an esoteric view of that. And that'll be okay. But you cannot say that God said no idolatry and then this idolatry is okay. It just doesn't work that way. You can't say that God told you to break off the bonds of slavery and then to take slaves. You can't say that. It is not within the, the domain of the divine. And that's where I'm going to go ahead and wrap this one up. If you were unclear about any of the things that I talked about, this Bible study is going to clear up a lot for you. It is long. I understand that. There are 161 videos in there. Most of them are about an hour long. We went through in extensive detail all the way through the important parts of the Bible. Right? We did the five main books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy in entirety. We went through Isaiah and Daniel and Ezekiel in their entirety. We didn't get to some of the minor prophets because, quite honestly, it wasn't necessary. We did Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, not quite in their entirety, but enough to show that it is not the correct path. Now, it might be the correct path for you. You can find God wherever you particularly choose to worship because God will find you. He will find you in Christianity. He will find you in Islam. He will find you in Buddhism. He will find you in Zoroastrianism. God will find you where you are. And you have to make the choice to actually follow him. But if you are expecting that someone else can make a sacrifice for you and you can live a life of sin because of that, you were severely mistaken. 
If you like what I'm doing over here, let me know down below. Give me a like, share, and a sub. Throw me a comment if you agree or disagree with anything that I have stated in this particular study or any of the other ones. If it remains respectfully, it gets to remain up. If you really like what I'm doing over here, hit me with that super thanks. And if there is something you would like to see me discuss in the manner that we are doing now, let me know in the comments as well. I am always looking for new content. To the crew. Thanks for hanging out. I appreciate every single minute that you were here with me, and I am praying for you every single day. Until next time, I love you. God loves you. You are perfect, whole, and complete, just the way that you are. And this has been Pitt's Take. Peace.